So we know that um, uh, germinal matrix hemorrhage is an important um, problem for pediatric neurosurgeons. Fortunately, the incidence seems to be decreasing with better pulmonary care, um, better uh, uh, critical care of these very fragile infants. But about 30 to 50 percent of children with ger severe germinal matrix hemorrhage will develop a ventricular enlargement. And some of those will go on to develop post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus that requires diversion. The problem is when this happens, they're oftentimes very small. They can be 7, 800, 900 grams, way too small for to accept a ventricular peritoneal shunt. So in many of those cases, temporary measures might be required, required in, in the smallest of these infants. Um, so the timing and, and when to intervene and, and how we intervene remains controversial. There's a wide range of practice patterns that the that, that guidelines are, are really not uh, very clear on this. And, and the determination to treat is really based on the clinical signs of the infant. If they're uh, symptomatic, sometimes they may uh, exhibit bradycardia or apnea. Um, they can have progressive ventricular enlargement and then other signs of raised intracranial pressure. So usually that's when the surgeon may, may deem it necessary to intervene. And again, there's some temporary measures, but really none of these are recommended in this day and age. So Diamox was used in the past, but really not recommended at this point. Um, carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. Frequent lumbar punctures, again, was used in the past, but it's they, they can be very problematic and very ineffective is the bottom line. So they're really very rarely if ever used. And direct ventricular puncture sometimes can be used to sample CSF if there's no way to get CSF in the other liner, but, but the problem with that is it leaves, leaves a mark. It can leave a significant tract for encephaly. So that's really been abandoned for, for um, routine use. And, and an external ventricular drain in a very small infant like this can also be very problematic in terms of um, just managing that because of keeping, it, keeping track of how much uh, uh, CSF is draining and also the high risk of infection. So most of these temporary measures have been abandoned Leave on this left side of the slide. What it comes down to really are a few other options. And one of those is a ventricular access device. And you can see there's an actual image of one there with a coin. So they're very tiny devices. Essentially, it's like a, a reservoir and catheter joint. There's different variations of that. Different manufacturers have different versions of that with different sizes. But essentially, it's placed into the ventricle and the subcutaneous reservoir is there and it can be accessed periodically as needed for control of the ventricular megaly. And using the best of cases, the ventricles stabilize. It's rare to see them get much smaller. Um, you can only tap these so many, so many or so often, um, any more than it, once or twice a day can be really difficult or problematic on the skin. But at least stabilize things until the point where the child may become uh, of sufficient size to accept a shunt if that's deemed necessary. And another option is, is a subgaleal shunt or a ventricular subgaleal shunt. And this is a picture from a colleague, but essentially it's a, the same type of device, but it's kind of left open on the side or the bottom. And the device is placed into the ventricle, but a large subgaleal pocket is created. This is a piece of like silastic attached to it with a few sutures to keep the galea or the scalp from, from um, contacting and then adhering to the underlying soft tissues and closing off that space. So the fluid, as you can see, collects underneath the scalp and it can be unsightly, but, but essentially it's kind of a more continuous drainage of the, of the CSF into the subgaleal space and it's absorbed that way as opposed to having to tap the shunt or tap the reservoir on a daily basis. So just um, another, another option for, for young infants. Um, eventually the decision needs to be made if the child will have, the device will need to be converted to a ventricular peritoneal shunt or some other uh, surgical, more definitive surgical treatment. So that's really all I wanted to say on some of these very young infants that may require surgery. You'll, you'll probably see these on a rotation from time to time, depending on um, which service you're rotating on as a student. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.